I want to take this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, here to really say thank you to you, to CERM, and to the people of California to really make this all happen. And uh, you see here in the background um, our new stem cell institute coming up, and I cannot tell you, which is in part funded by CERM, so I cannot tell you how happy and how excited you are to actually move into this building later this year. So, um, uh, embryonic development really has been considered um, as a one-way road. So whenever you differentiate in the embryo, it, the notion has been in the field that you can never, be, you can never go back. However, as, uh, as people, uh, many people of you probably know, is that uh, it was really Dolly the sheep, um, the Dolly experiment, which, which proved this con concept completely wrong. And we now know that you can go from a completely mature adult cells all the way back to a totipotent state. And how was uh, Dolly really created? Dolly was created by nuclear transfer. So um, 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 what, what Ian Wilmot and colleagues did, they, they took an adult cell, took out the nucleus, implanted that into an um, enucleate egg, in, into an enucleate oocyte, and this reconstituted embryo would then um, be allowed to develop into an, ent an entire, en entire animal. In this case, this was, was Dolly. So this really led to a very intriguing medical perspective. You could now envision to take a, a let's say, a skin biopsy from, from a patient, do this nuclear transfer procedure by implanting a nucleus into an oocyte, and then generate embryonic stem cell lines from these um, very early nuclear transfer um, um, embryos, and then use those um, Em, uh, patient-specific embryonic stem cell lines to differentiate uh, into something uh, that you can then use to transplant back into exact same patients, uh, uh, same patient's body. So this concept uh, then was uh, really widely known as therapeutic cloning. Um, but very rapidly, it's, uh, it became clear that this approach, even though really uh, fascinating, uh, would have made major hurdles if we would really want to translate it into clinics. Um, not only is the technique of nuclear transfer extremely inefficient and, and laborious, also, of course, there is an ethical debate about, uh, about this. After all, we would have to use um, human embryos, uh, uh, human oocytes, to, and human embryos that would have to destroy to, to, to generate those embryonic stem cell lines. So that is really the reason why many people set out to identify these um, reprogramming factors um, which have to be present in the oocyte. And, and once we know those factors, we should be able to turn in, in, an adult cell right into an embryonic stem cell. And um, it was then in 2006 when um, uh, it was really the pioneering work of Shinya Yamanaka in Japan, where he had identified those four factors, OCT4, SOX2, CIMIC, and KLE4, who would do exactly this job. And we um, can now turn um, skin cells directly into uh, pluripotent stem cells, and we call them now induced pluripotent stem cells, or, or IPS cells. And with this major advance in the field, we now really believe this can become feasible. Um, we, we really can generate patient-derived and patient-specific um, IPS cells for, for a therapy. But not only can we uh, generate these um, um, patient-matched cells for, 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 for a therapy as, as autolocosaurs, we can also take advantage of these great properties that these embryonic stem cell-like cells or these IPS cells have, which is that they can grow extremely well by maintaining their pluripotent state. And that means we can do very, um, um, very targeted and um, uh, defined genetic modifications in these cells. So, um, quite in contrast to um, uh, to a regular gene therapy approach, and, and um, Al just mentioned um, uh, one of them, um, where, where you basically have the the um, complication that by introducing genes randomly into genome, into the genome, you, you don't exactly know where these um, vectors are landing, and they can cause cancer. They can, they can cause they can cause the activation of of cancer-causing genes. Whereas in these stem cells, we can introduce genetic material in a very defined locus, um, which is a, a very safe um, genetic um, 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 or, or gene therapy approach. So we can really think of um, taking a, um, a, a patient's skin cell which has a mutation, uh, which has a bad gene, and then make stem cell lines from, from these uh, skin cells and repair the exact mutation 
in, in, in its own position, in its genomic locus, and then differentiate these cells into something that you can then treat the patients with. So when I came, to, I came to Stanford, I ran into Al and Tony, and, um, and um, I, I got to know of this, of this horrible disease. And so we, so we are faced now with this, um, with this uh, um, um, horrible disease uh, that you just heard about. And, and we said, well, no, why don't we try to make this really happen? Not only talk about and dream, really try to put this into people and, and, and develop this therapy. So what are the hurdles to, um, to, to achieve this? So we think it's really these four important things that we have to tackle in order to, um, to develop this, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of therapy. Um, first, we really have to um, develop uh, or, or, or ensure that this reprogramming is safe. Then we have to um, 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 optimize the gene replacement in these stem cells. Thirdly, we have to find ways to safely and efficiently differentiate these cells into, in this case, keratinocytes. And finally, we have then to, use, uh, to, to, um, to, uh, to develop the methods to then actually use these um, uh, keratinocyte sheets to transplant back onto the patients. And um, as you just heard from Al, um, the, the last step, the transplantation, um, of, of keratinocytes onto patients really has been worked out already um, very well in, in, uh, in, at Stanford and, and other places. And in principle, also all these three other components have been shown uh, to work. So it's really only a matter of optimizing all these, these steps to um, make this a real therapy. Um, so just to briefly um, summarize, so in, we have the same um, target with this stem cell combined gene therapy approach, as uh, Al mentioned, for the recessive di uh, disorders. We are focusing on a dominant disease uh, for now because this is really the only way um, to, to treat this disease because it, it does not make sense to add um, um, more genes into, into uh, the dominant um, cases. Um, I mentioned already um, some advantages over the, uh, over the conventional gene therapy um, um, approaches. Um, um, especially the safety concerns, um, also the, um, uh, the advantage that we have with, with dominant disorders. And uh, in principle, we can use these pluripotent stem cells not only for um, generating keratinocytes, but also any kind of other um, cell types, such as fibroblasts, or um, people are even thinking about blood cells uh, that could be used to, to treat those patients. So um, we have already been able to uh, generate a number of um, EB patient-derived iPS lines. So on the left, um, you see the, uh, freshly um, uh, growing fibroblasts from a skin biopsy from one of these patients. And then after about six or so weeks, we can, uh, um, we can generate these, um, these iPS cells, which grow in these colonies, as you can see on the right side. And these, uh, these uh, um, iPS cells express the common markers that, that, we, um, that we also find in, in the embryonic stem cells there, shown uh, below, the SSEA. Uh, three and four and the tra um, uh, epitopes. Um, and we also uh, um, have shown that we can do a, um, genetic targeted genetic modifications of a human uh, SOC17 locus in human embryonic stem cells and we are currently working on um, applying this exact same technology to the collagen 7A1 locus. Yes, and with that I would like to thank you and um, uh, ask Tony to, to come up to the podium. <laughs>